Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Zantanetti. Sorry for the little interruption there. But we're here, and we are still talking about salvation, the word that stretches from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Let me ask you a question. How long is your salvation? If it's inside of you, do you think that it will last until Jesus comes back? <laughs> Well, you know, the Bible tells us that the arm of the Lord is not too short that it cannot save. Well, if it's not too short and it's a long arm, I guess he's going to keep us by his grace. Psalms 119 verse 94, the capstone, the cornerstone of this whole teaching on salvation. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. You know, when you know God's word and you know what he says about salvation, every time you're in trouble, tell me, will you say, Lord, save me. I am yours. I need you. Let's go to Romans chapter 11 and let's look at what it says there. And it says, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom of the, of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord that or become his counselor? Or who first gave to him and will be repaid to him? In other words, who gave to God first that God says, okay, I'm going to pay you back. But because of him or from him and through him and to him be all things, to him be glory forever and ever. Now, listen, this is Paul. This is Paul concluding something that he wrote, of course, in Romans chapter 11 gives us this doxology is called a doxology, and actually it's a, it's a song. It's, 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 it's the highlight of a song, the crescendo. And uh, we have also where uh, kabad is glory. But what is this mystery? What is this, this excitement that Paul, you know, talked about when he ends chapter 11? Well, you got to read it for yourself. And it talks about Israel, no matter how Israel was no matter how rebellious, even though they were cut off for a time, they were not cut off from the salvation of God. They were cut off from the calling, and the Gentiles were grafted in, and so we are in the dispensation, the time of the, de of the Gentiles. Now think about this. The word dispensation is in the Bible, and it represents an economy, an economy, just like we have an economy in our state, uh, you know, the United States, and of course the whole world has an economy, Sometimes the economy is bad, sometimes it's good. But when it comes to salvation, the economy of God is grace, and it can never be exhausted. Wow. The treasury of God's grace is full. The treasury of God's grace is full, and it is always available to every believer. Now, salvation, when we talk about salvation, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, and let's look at verse 5, because... This verse of scripture has uh, caused so much controversy uh, with those who don't really understand the eternal salvation of Christ. Now, folks, either it is eternal or it is not. Now, some people will say it is eternal, but remember that we, we, can, we can walk away from that and never come back. That is preposterous and impossible. I have never seen a backslider not come back to God somehow, some way, even if it's on their deathbed. Well... Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 tells us, predestining, predestinating us to adoption through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, think, I want you to think about that for a moment. Because here's where we have the assurance that not only are we saved, but we are in the hand of God, and he has given us everything that we need so that we can be saved. Now, what was the salvation? The salvation came through Jesus Christ himself. And what was the pleasure of God's will in doing this? It was his good pleasure. And remember that we were not there when he predestined us. We were not there when he chose us. We were not there in the sense of being born when he said, you're mine. When I have to say this, that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, excuse me, 2, chapter 2, verse 19 says, that the foundation of God stands firm, having this seal upon it. And let me tell you what the seal says. The Lord knows those who are his. And yet we were sealed 
with the promised Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, all these scriptures are coming to mind. Thank you, Jesus. That when we first heard the gospel of our salvation, we trusted in Jesus and we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now think about that. Now, the Apostle Paul assures us that this is a predestinated adoption. Now think about this. But it is not just a natural adoption, it is a heavenly one, supernatural, not made by the hands of man, but through Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of God's will. Wow. Think about that for a moment, folks. How solid, how beautiful is this salvation that we have. And where is it? Well, since the blood of Jesus Christ has eternal, watch this, has his eternal blood in it for our salvation, so is the adoption made by God for the believer in Christ. The adoption of God is irrevocable. And please, I uh, made a mistake there. I put revocable. It's irrevocable, meaning that it cannot be changed. It cannot be uh, taken back. It cannot be changed. It cannot be eradicated. And it cannot be reversed. The last thing that Jesus Christ said on the cross was what? It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. It cannot be void. The work of the Lord that he started in every believer is to complete, is to complete the work that he started. And where did he start this? On the cross, even to the day that he appears to take away his congregation. Did you see that? Now, I want to go into Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, because this is where I want to really just dig in just a little bit. A lot of people have controversy with this too, but it is what it is. The Bible says it. Being confident or persuaded of this very thing, that the one who, having begun a good work in you, will finish it until the day that he comes back, until the day that Jesus Christ comes back. Think about this now. You did not start the work. God drew you, gave you to the Son. Keep looking at that verse of Scripture. Keep looking at it. You did not begin this work. Christ did it. And Paul was so confident, he was persuaded, because he knows the Word of God, that one thing is that God began the work and he will finish it. You did not start it and you cannot finish it. Now, being confident, this is a strong language. It means to be fully and firmly persuaded or convinced. Tell me, are you fully persuaded? Are you firmly persuaded? Are you convinced that this work that Jesus started in you is going to stay there? Because, listen, if he started it, he's not only going to finish it, but he doesn't need you to help him. All the work of God from the beginning, no man did it. He chose men to do things. But believe me, God is the one that works his salvation in all of us. Now, the Apostle Paul was absolutely convinced that the salvation that God started through Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection will continue to work in every believer until he returns. Salvation is by favor. It is not by the merit of man. We cannot claim the favor of the Lord upon ourselves by some confession of particular sins or to bring eternal salvation by something that we say. It's something that we have to believe and be completely assured that Jesus Christ died on the cross and only by accepting that sacrifice, there's only one sacrifice in this world that brings us to salvation we could put that scripture back up. I want to see it one more time. That saying, yeah. Paul was absolutely convinced that the salvation of God started through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to listen to this. The Old Testament salvation was conditional based on the written law, whereas the New Testament salvation is not conditional based on the letter, but the eternal sacrifice of Christ. From this perspective of grace, 
God chose Israel to be his, but the law was to be kept in order for them to receive salvation. But only in Christ is the believer preserved by the providential salvation of God. The salvation of Christ was resolved, determined, and kept tightly in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. One must not try to escape, nor delude, nor distort the providential will, will of God in salvation. Now, I want to just read a verse of scripture. Even, now watch, watch this now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, that even when we were dead because of our acts of disobedience, he brought us to life along with the Messiah. Did you get that? It is by grace that you have been delivered. He brought us together. Now, I want you to see something in John chapter 14, verse 1, which is powerful. You know the scripture, but do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwellings or dwelling places, but if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, I want you to look at that verse of Scripture there. Notice that he said that there's a place in heaven. Now, up to this point, Man did not enter into the throne room of God as in the New Testament because Jesus had not passed through the heavens as the high priest. Remember that once a year, the high priest used to enter into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle with blood and sprinkle that blood and confess the sins of the people and God would forgive the sins of his people. And this happened every year. As a matter of fact, we're coming to Yom Kippur which is the Day of Atonement, and it's going to happen soon. Next week, on Sunday, it starts the 10 days of repentance. You may want to look into that. Uh, I'm going to be those, myself just in those 10 days, just looking for that repentance in my life for a change. That's what repentance means, to go 180 degrees in the other direction because we're moved away from God. And so once a year, God would take the... The, the prayers of the high priest along with the sprinkling of the blood and he would forgive the people. And watch this now. Here, Jesus Christ said he's going away and that the disciples could not follow him right now. And so when he went away, he showed himself to the Father as not only the high priest of the New Testament, but the very mercy seat. He is the mercy seat where the, in the Old Testament, the high priest used to sprinkle blood upon the mercy seat Jesus is the mercy seat. He entered in by his own blood, the Bible says, and we enter into Christ, the new and living way, and we are in him. We're presented with the Messiah, and he said, watch this, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. What place is that? Right at the very throne of grace, right at the very throne room of God. When he showed himself to the Father, the Father was pleased with the sacrifice and he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for his saints, and through him is where we live. God has no condemnation for any of his children because we are standing in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I want to let you know something else about relationship. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. When you are saved, you don't work on your relationship. Your relationship with God is that he is your father and you are his child. But what we work with is our intimacy, our fellowship with God. The Bible tells us that fellowship, right fellowship with God is through, his, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Even 1 John chapter 1 tells us, um, and this is the message we have heard from him, God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that God is light and in him there is no darkness. Now, if we say we have not sinned, we say that God is a liar. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Notice it's not really talking about relationship. It's talking about koinonia, fellowship. And so our fellowship 
can be broken with God if we continue to do things and not repent. Yeah, our fellowship can be broken, but not our relationship. Our relationship cannot be broken any more than you can break your relationship with your parents, meaning that your father is your father. There's nothing you can do about that. You can have a stepfather, and there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible talks about that. But the DNA of your parents is inside of you. And when you get saved, the DNA, the spiritual DNA of Christ the Messiah is inside of you. And that cannot be removed. That's why we have been predestined to be adopted by Jesus Christ. And once we're adopted, we cannot be unadopted. Impossible. All right. And he said he's going to prepare a place for you. And that place, my friend, is right at the throne room of God. For even Romans chapter 5 tells us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have access to this throne of grace where we now stand. Think about that now. All right, so what is the purpose of holy living then? See, a, purpose, a person says this, Well, if I'm saved, are you saying that I can do whatever I want? Well, the question shouldn't be that. The question is, if I'm saved, can I really do what I want? Can I really continue to sin and be happy? Can I really continue to sin and not be grateful for the eternal sacrifice? That's the whole fight that people say, well, wait a minute. So you're saying that I could do whatever I want? Go ahead and try it and see how happy you're going to be. So what is the purpose of holy living? is so that we may share in the purity of God and the fruit of righteousness, but also that we may be joyful here on the earth as we wait for the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what motivates us to live a life of holiness? It is the very grace of God that teaches us to say no to worldly passions, to lust, evil, and everything that is contrary to God's word and his kingdom. Look what Titus 2.11 says. For the saving grace of God has appeared to all men, instructing us that having denied ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live discreetly and righteously and godly in the present age. Looking, looking, looking for the blessed hope and appearance of of the glory of, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself on our behalf that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify a special people for himself, zealous to do good works. Can you really be saved and continue to sin like it's no problem? I doubt that. If the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, then you have the promise of Abraham. God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph that their offspring would be fruitful and multiply. Joseph was the governor of Egypt, and even through that, God saved not only Egypt, but his people. Now let's look at what salvation really means. It says salvation is the preservation from destruction, from failure, or evil. The Greek word for salvation, soteria, which means deliverance, preservation, and salvation. If that's what the word means, listen now, if that's what the word means, then how are we not going to be preserved? How are we not going to be delivered? How are we not going to have salvation if it means preserved? Jesus has us in his hands tightly, and the Father has us in his hand tightly. And nothing can get in between that and snatch you out of his hands. There's no devil in hell, Satan himself, no evil influence, no power. The Bible tells us what can separate us from the love of God. It says no, not death, not life, no angel, no principality, no powers of things to come, no powers or things to come, things now, things in the future. Nor anything in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Preserved to be taken safely to heaven. Think about that now. We are on our way to heaven. We have been secured by the blood of Christ. And you know, even under the most oppressive living conditions, as in Egypt, as slaves, 
this promise was kept. This promise was kept by God for his people, and he did not allow Pharaoh to destroy them. Not even the evil, powerful, genocidal hand of Pharaoh could prevent the population increase of the Israelites. God had something in mind, and he would not fail to keep it. I want you to see this last verse of scripture because it's very powerful, and it's a fulfillment of Christ in Isaiah. Behold, I and the children whom Jehovah has given to me are for signs and wonders in Israel from Jehovah of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a literal place in Jerusalem, but it is the spiritual place of the church of God in Christ. The Mount Zion is the church of God. Now think about this. Even Isaiah chapter 2 tells us, In the last days the mountain of the Lord shall be established as chief among the hills. Mount Zion, many shall see and believe and put their trust in him. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Let us go up to the house of the God of Jacob. Why? We're going to be taught by him. This is, this is when it shall all come to pass. But behold, I and the children whom Jehovah has given to me. You were given to Jesus, and it is for sign and wonders. And I want to share something with you real quick before we close about this sign. We're going to leave the scripture up right now. I want you to see it. In Genesis, we have Cain, who murdered his brother, and because of this, he would have to leave the mountain of God where they all dwelled. And Cain understood to be out of the presence of that mountain is to be out of the face of God, even though God is on the, the, the whole earth. He said, I'm going to be a vagabond. I'm going to be a traveler. And anyone who sees me is going to want to kill me. And the Lord, the Bible says, put a mark on him. On him, he put a mark. And a lot of people say, well, we, don't, we really don't know what the mark is, but not to the Jews. The Jews will tell you exactly what the mark is. And if you study, you will find out what the mark is because it's in the Hebrew letters right there. And it's, it's, the, it's the letters. There's three letters. It is the Alpha, the Vav, and the Omega. In the Hebrew, it is the Aleph, the Vav, and the Tav. Let me tell you what that word signifies and how it is pronounced. It's Uth. Uth. Now think about this. This sign had the first letter, which represents the name of Yahweh, the Alpha in Greek, and the last sign, the Tau or the Omega, and in between was the Vav, the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's the picture of a nail. This is the same word that here in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom Jehovah, Yahweh, the self-existing existing one, has given to me are for uth and wonders, signs in Israel. Israel knows one thing if they know nothing. They know that the Christians worship Jesus, their Messiah, our Messiah, and many of them have not accepted it yet, but they know when they look at the life of Jesus, there is a strong resemblance of prophecy that has been fulfilled. And I want you to see this, that we will stand with all God's children, those who receive the Messiah in the last day, and he will say in heaven, Behold, I and the children whom Jehovah has given to me are for signs and wonders in Israel, but Jehovah, the host, who dwells in Mount Zion, the church. God bless you. Have a wonderful, spirit-filled day. And remember, you are a child of God. You are adopted by the eternal blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.